Good afternoon, it's Wednesday the 29th of March 2017, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. And uh, we're going to be joined today by Alex Thompson uh, with Eastern Approaches. And of course, Alex will be reporting uh, from the Netherlands. Well, I can't stop smiling. It must be World Happiness Day all over again, because if we're to believe the fake news, it is, of course, the day that uh, UK leaves the European Union. Uh, Whoop, whoopie do. Whoopie do, Brian. We're out, uh, except we aren't. Uh, so there is Theresa signing the letter yesterday. The letter has now been delivered to Donald Tusk and she's now been in Parliament giving a statement and what a wonderful statement she gave. Um, and uh, so uh, what can we say about it? We're not out. We're not out for at least two years. Um, and uh, at least two years, if we're ever out. She said in her in her speech to Parliament that we were going to be leaving the institutions. I'd like to know, Brian, which institutions we're going to be leaving, since we're not going to be leaving European Common Defence. We're not going to be leaving Interpol. We're not going to be taking control of our fisheries, and we're going to come on to that in a second, and our uh, agri agriculture. Security. Uh, we're not going to take control of our security, that's true. Um, and uh, we're not going to really take control of our borders. We're certainly not taking control of our law, because we're, re we're introducing all the European law all the aquas into uh, into British domestic law. Um, so the question is, uh, Alex, perhaps we can bring you in here and ask, um, we, you know, if What's we don't changed? appear to be <laughs> leaving, what has actually changed? I think what's changed, uh, Mike, is that for show we are not going to be given a seat at the table, which is filmed most, which is the uh, European Council, uh, an institution which didn't exist at the founding of the EEC and was only introduced later when governments wanted a, a look in. Uh, and that's with the, uh, the large table where the heads of government meet every uh, quarter or so, certainly at the beginning and end of every half yearly rotating presidency they do. And uh, also we're not going to be, have a European commissioner or commissar to use the, the proper German temp to, the terminology. Uh, we're going to be out of that and we're not going to have any MEPs to plead for supposedly Britain's case. Uh, so those three institutions we're going to be out of, but then there's plenty of other countries in Europe which have, um, well, not plenty, several, which have, have volunteered all those um, surrenders of sovereignty, uh, Switzerland, Norway and other EFTA type countries in various degrees and, and aspirant countries in the Balkans, which have already said they'll respect ECJ judgments and be subject to European arrest, arrest warrants, corpus juris. That's the position we're going to be in, basically. We're going to be uh, dictated to by the EU without being in it. Um, well, um... <laughs> That's some interesting points there. Let's go through a few of them. Uh, I'm just going to start off with Foreign Policy magazines. magazine here saying, uh, can the Brexit deniers finally shut up now? Well, of course we can't because uh, Brexit hasn't happened yet. The process has begun, perhaps, but uh, nothing. There's been no final outcome. We'll see what happens next. Uh, but Alex, uh, The Guardian here, Brexit deal with cutoff date for free movement could be vetoed by MEPs. Uh, and uh, just to quote a little bit from this, The Guardian has learned that the MEPs will also insist that their resolution that a trade deal cannot be sealed within two years, but only after the UK leaves, echoing the position of the European Commission, it will demand that the European Court of Justice should be the competent authority for the interpretation and enforcement of the withdrawal agreement. And while MEPs say that uh, Britain should be allowed to change its mind about leaving the EU during the two years of talks, uh, they will insist that this must be strictly on terms decreed by the remaining 27 EU member states. So there's a number of points there. Uh, first of all, uh, suggesting that the European Court of Justice um, should have any veto or, or at least have comp be the competent authority for interpretation and enforcement of the withdrawal agreement. Uh, Theresa May suggesting uh, in the House of Commons uh, during her speech that uh, we would be in future ignoring anything that the European Court of Justice says. So I'm not quite clear how that works. Uh, and, uh, and But there's always the caveat that we have the option to change our minds with it any time within the next two years. Uh, so that's always possible. And that is, of course, what The Guardian and the BBC are driving at, Mike, is uh, if this is all too difficult for your poor little noddles, then uh, come back under the protective blanket of the EU, now having given up the British exemption. So we would have to be in the euro, fully cover, fully contributing to the CAP and all that nonsense uh, within Schengenland because of these other principles of new members which we would become. So um, that's what's going on, Mike. And uh, as you say, the, the mere suggestion that the ECJ judgments uh, or, or jurisprudence from the ECJ 
in Luxembourg would would be would uh, be dominant in interpretation of how we leave. That just gives the light to the idea that we're regaining or reasserting our sovereignty, because uh, obviously if we were, uh, what used to be the law lords and ultimately the Her Majesty would uh, would de decide the terms on which we leave because we got in by the route of a treaty. Now, if we are pulling out in pure treaty terms, then it's royal prerogative territory again. But the fact that the, the government is already, or MEPs are insisting that the government should uh, should be subject to the ECJ just gives the light of that. We're going to be uh, in the Napoleonic legal system regardless, and the Queen and people will not regain their sovereignty. Um, OK, well, the BBC uh, here saying, how will Brussels react to Article 50 being triggered? Uh, and they're saying most MEPs you talk to still consider it an act of almost suicidal self-harm and feel that the UK has con uh, consciously uncoupled itself from one of modern history's most important drivers of peace and prosperity. And you do hear irritation at some British attitudes. Foremost among uh, the resentments is the idea that a large, rich European power is walking away from financial commitments to poorer partners. Um, so again, yeah, yes. you, you see the, the, the BBC is allied with uh, some British, but mostly continental MEPs against the British people and the sovereignty of the British people. The BBC uh, obviously claims to be just reflecting MEPs uh, opinions here, but this frustration that the BBC clearly is pushing upon us is the frustration of, of foreign countries that we are not serving uh, their uh, requirements with our finance and manpower and legal system and other resources. So the idea that MEPs uh, represent, British MEPs represent the British people has completely been lost here. And the problem is, of course, that the EEC, as it then was, was set up as a commission dominated institution. And as I said, the European Council came along because governments wanted to say the parliament started toothless, but has become something of a semi-serious player in the EU because of the uh, the need for some kind of democratic shop window. And it's the European Parliament which is ultimately going to vote on the terms of this deal. And uh, OK, we don't trust Mr Farage very much on this uh, broadcast, but uh, he has been just one of the well-informed voices who have said at the end of all this, the, the European Parliament could say no. Of course, he then says we could trade with other countries on uh, on WTO rules better than what we currently have. But that doesn't address the sovereignty issue. Um, well, um, Radio 4 this morning, I did hear this myself, uh, just around 10 to, 10 to 9 this morning, they started uh, uh, their propaganda um, using the story of Elizabeth I, as, as, as the notes that you've sent to me on this, uh, being formally excommunicated. They're, basically, they were saying that we've been through this Brexit process before. Uh, and they went on to discuss uh, Henry VIII laws and, and uh, Henry, the fact that Henry VIII had uh, told the Pope to take a hike uh, many years ago. Uh, and, uh, of course, there was the enmity, enmity between uh, the monarchy of Britain and the continental nations, suggesting that that wasn't new. Uh, it was absolutely shameless. But, of course, what uh, they are doing is reflecting this, a new campaign from Global Justice Now. After Article 50, UK democracy will be chilled by a great repeal bill, warns a new briefing. So this is a new briefing from a legal academic warning that uh, the bill... The, the Great Repeal Bill could affect UK democracy for decades to come. Uh, this is uh, what he's describing as proposed new Henry VIII powers. Uh, this is the, the former by a former uh, sorry by the former Lord Chief Justice, a self-inflicted blow that could be that could only be used in a national emergency. And basically, what they're saying is uh, that you know the Great Repeal Bill, which is this piece of legislation they're going to push through, which is going to repeal the 1972. European Communities Act, and which is going to bring in all this European law uh, into uh, British domestic law. Um, they're suggesting that under the uh, radar, as it were, alongside that, uh, we'll effectively be giving uh, Theresa May almost presidential powers to repeal legislation which has come from Europe uh, without the will of Parliament having any influence on that. Of course, that all depends on what it says in this great repeal bill, which has not been published yet. So, so this is really a nonsense article and, 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 and goes alongside what the BBC was talking about. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the focus here, I think, Alex, should be that uh, with the great repeal bill should be that uh, we're even bringing in all this European legislation without any uh, consideration about whether we want it or not. Uh, we're just going to bring it all in and, and continue as if nothing had happened. Uh, bring in all the worst of it uh, and not worry about what our constitution says in the meantime. That's clearly what it's about, Mike, uh, distracting from the fact that in one fell swoop, uh, the government is now handing over 
uh, the entire acquis communautaire of 40, 50 years uh, into British, uh, or rather I should say the law of England and Wales and the law of Northern Ireland and the law of Scotland, because there's three separate jurisdictions in the UK. But that, that's what uh, is being done, you see, as, as, a, as a fait accompli. Uh, the, the, the Henry VIII stuff uh, and the, 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 the piece you showed was actually uh, from yesterday, the, yesterday, the Tuesday, the 28th of March. So I think the Today programme has been doing a whole series on this. Uh, it's, it's part of a meme which uh, the establishment is using, which is the idea that big bad Henry VIII, and we all know he was bad, don't we, children? Uh, that's being held up as a way to say, well, if we divorce from Europe, then we're going to have sorry consequences and we're going to be driven into these lesser trading partners like the nasty Slavs and the nasty Arabs and so on. Uh, totally economically illiterate. And David Ellis and I uh, are hoping to write a proper article about this because the theme of the great divorce between Henry VIII and Europe uh, is is much misunderstood, the complications and the economics on all sides, the fact that uh, Scotland was not uh, united with England at that time, politically or, or at a crown level. Uh, it's it's all a massive smokescreen and it's it's, it's a, a sense of, um, or it's an indication of, of journalists' ignorance of history, sometimes a willful ignorance, of course. Um, and, uh, of course, the government must commit to taking back control of British fisheries. I haven't heard anything from anyone suggesting that this was likely to be the case. No, there's none at all. Uh, this this article on Brexit Central uh, on the government must commit to taking back control of British fish, Britain's fisheries points out that a company, uh, sorry, an organisation called uh, Fishing for Leave, uh, is pretty much alone in campaigning to make sure that we're not betrayed by the Great Repeal Bill because part of the Acu Communautaire, uh, part which Edward Heath uh, actually had to lie through his teeth about, uh, was the fishing rights. You know, uh, we we were in a batch in 1972 that were going to join the EEC with the Republic of Ireland, Denmark and Norway. Well, the, the, the first two of those did join with us on 1173, and Norway didn't because during 1972, the Norwegian Prime Minister, serving his people, shockingly enough, told them that they were going to lose their rich, uh, the exclusivity of their rich fishing grounds as part of the membership terms. Uh, there's actually a letter which was published in the Oslo Press in 72 from Heath saying, my dear fellow Prime Minister, please conspire with me to cover up from your people the fact that they're going to lose their fishing grounds. And that, that's where the Aki Communautaire begins with the fishing. And so this Brexit Central article highlights the fact that we're going to throw away our trump card of uh, of our fishing grounds. We're just going to start the negotiation with Barnier and his team at the European Commission by saying, you can have the fish, what else do you want? Uh, the other thing we've got to consider there, Alex, is, of course, is it's not just taking back uh, Britain's fisheries, it's actually rebuilding the whole of Britain's fishing industry, which was completely decimated in order to fit us into the uh, European uh, fisheries policy. So, so we had vessels cut up with chainsaws burnt on the beaches and with the demise of those vessels went the went the local communities cornwall lowest oft and all the rest of the of, of the very big fishing um uh, areas of britain just simply wiped out and the same up in scotland so this this would require massive british um investment to try and rebuild this industry, and I don't, I don't see a single word said about this at the moment. Um, I think you've put your finger on it, Brian. That, that the reason, of course, that you have a personal interest for, for newer viewers is that in one of your later posts with the Royal Navy, late eighties, early nineties, uh, you were in fishing compliance. So uh, you actually had a moment of awakening, didn't you, when you had to deprive a Scots skipper of his livelihood by uh, removing his nets, which were the only way he was going to be able to fish economically. So there was a big push at that time. And as you say, Brian, um, this is another distraction technique, because um, if we were going to reclaim our fishing, we would have to have government subsidy, something the EU banned, which we now are allowed to do again, promote our own industries. We would then have to put up the readies to, as, as the government um, to allow fishermen to rebuild and the next generation of fishermen to have boats and decent equipment and safety gear. And that, that money and interest is just not there, of course. Um, but, but the point that we've made a number of times in, in articles on the column uh, on the UK column website is that the Aki communautaire, at least as far as the Europeans are concerned, and this, therefore this is bound to be a condition of, the, uh, of the, the negotiation and why the Great Repeal Bill exists in the first place, that once you have given away sovereignty to this supranational super state, uh, you cannot repatriate them. That is the point of the Aki communautaire. That's absolutely it. Um, the EU is unique in, in global uh, diplomatic institutions uh, in that it is not just an international uh, organization by treaty, but it is also a supranational body. It sits above and replaces 
uh, your parts of your government, by the connivance of your government over the heads of the people. The continentals are starting to realize this as well. So if you leave a, a diplomatic, sorry, if you leave an international organization, it's just a question of tying up loose ends for when you will uh, cease to be, a, to be a member of the body. And that's how the press is trying to present leaving the EU to us. But we are leaving a supranational body with a doctrine of once uh, acquired, always acquired sovereignty. So uh, extricating ourselves from that is just something that hasn't been done before in world history, because the EU itself is, is the first time in world history we've tried such a thing. Yeah. Um, OK, well, let's uh, let's move on to this then um, from The Telegraph. UKIP's biggest donor and David Cameron's former strategist in plot to oust 100 Remain MPs. Uh, this is uh, Steve Hilton. He's launched his uh, crowd pack funding campaign uh, to help more independent and independent minded people stand for office, uh, whether at the local or national level. So Aaron Banks has given a, a million pounds to UKIP uh, before the last general election. And he told uh, Chopper's uh, Brexit podcast on the Telegraph here, they had dubbed it a drain, uh, the swamp strategy under plans, uh, Steve Hilton's new pa patriotic alliance, sorry, movement uh, to help organize and fund independent candidates to stand against and particularly bad MPs. So um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that Chopper's Brexit podcast, we're now on episode four, is well worth it. They're, they're very dull half hours uh, with bad audio uh, filmed, uh, recorded in the pub somewhere mostly. But they're worth a careful listen because they, you get gems like this. Uh, I would say that Steve Hilton, who's a former Cameron advisor, and Aaron Banks, who's just split, split with UKIP or been uh, turfed out of UKIP, the big donor to UKIP he was. These two men are not ideal. They don't have our convictions about the British Constitution, but at least they're men with some publicity platforms, some money and some now saying we need to get rid of uh, at least 100 traitor MPs who have been demonstrably uh, what's what's said here is that they're the worst of the, the bottom of the barrel or something. Yes, Mr. Barron's key advisor, uh, Mr. Banks key advisor, Andy Wigmore, says that this alliance, uh, which is um, the patriotic alliance that Aaron Banks is setting up, uh, it's not a party, by the way. He, he had to correct the, the people in the podcast about this. It's a movement, not a party. But this this, this alliance uh, has going, has already identified 103 MPs, which, quote, we consider are not fit for purpose. Quote, there is a multiple of facets that classify them, these MPs, as rubbish. Now, this is good talk, isn't it? This is what we need the British people to be realising, that if you vote for a party man or woman, you're going to get rubbish on the bottom of the barrel, intellectually, patriotically, and in every other way. You're going to get the worst possible outcome. So uh, there's there's some hopeful stirrings. And Steve Hilton, of course, he's a cameraman. He's, he's been in the system rather questionably. But he's bringing into British politics the idea that it, it exists in America of a PAC, a political action campaign, where citizens actually fund, crowdfund, he says it deliberately in his name, uh, efforts to get good candidates and, and people who will obey the electorate. So this has to be a good thing, even if the men running it are not ideal. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'd have to add to that, um, Alex, that this this kind of movement, I think, has, has, um, has got some real value. But with it has got to come the knowledge of what people are actually fighting. We know that many uh, UKIP councillors, for example, were elected. They, they were good people. They wanted to do a good job. But when they got into local authorities, they were simply uh, totally unequipped to actually deal with the type of uh, environment that they were then working in. So part of the job we've got to do, it's a movement to wake up people to what they're really fighting and how the other side works. And I'll just drop it, drop it in because uh, when you were talking about Theresa May, the word Erasmus keeps coming into my mind because of course she's keen to keep that. What is that agenda about is bringing international and internationalist agenda into Britain's universities so that we have youngsters who are trained to think outside a national identity. If MPs or if local councillors don't understand that this is the sort of thing they're up against, they're not going to produce the results. Mm. Well, let's uh, have a look at the BBC. And uh, I couldn't resist visiting Reality Check uh, because there's no greater oxymoron than BBC News and Reality Check. Uh, but here was one of their little articles. Will the UK pay a 60 billion divorce bill? And uh, when we get into the text of this, I need to press the right button here. Here we go. Um, it, uh, it becomes very, very interesting to get any potential figures. You have to work out a value for the EU's liabilities, the money it owes at the point that the UK is likely to leave. Then you subtract the value of the EU's assets and decide what percentage of the balance 
is the responsibility of the UK. This is a sort of five-year-old's accountancy lesson by the BBC. Yeah, but how do you do that anyway if you don't have any audited accounts? Well, we're coming on to that bit, okay. Mike. Uh, let's have a look at this. The Commission's negotiating team has made no public comment on how it intends to calculate the cost of the divorce agreement, but there's certainly a way to get to a figure of 60 billion. Well, there's a way to get to a figure of 600 billion. Um, this is really a outstandingly, um, I've got to use the word crappy reporting by the BBC. How do they get away with this? It's unbelievable. But Mike, you uh, got in there very quickly because, of course, we're talking missing money. Now, I went to full fact because they tell the truth. And I thought I'm going to find a lot of information about EU accounts there. And there is a lot of information, but unfortunately, some of it's a bit missing. So here it says the auditors give a on and uh, quite clearly uh, there's something missing in there. They give a on the accuracy and accountability uh, reliability of the accounts and they gave give an a ah of the EU. So there's definitely some facts missing. Some facts missing from the full fact yeah, website. That, but don't worry shame. too much. It's a um, few, few little mistakes by full facts, but they're checking other people. Uh, but then they said, don't worry, because the EU accounts were accurate in 2015, although errors persist. Yeah. So, right, so, so they're accurate, but full of errors. Well, they're accurate, but the EU's full of errors. But there are only little errors, apparently, Mike, so we don't have to bother about them. How? But sorry, how many little errors are there? Because well, if you've got lots of little errors, that becomes a big error. 3.8% <laughs> of 145 billion euros. In 2015, the EU spent 145 billion. And then it says uh, down in the second paragraph, but it did find that 3.8% of EU spending was subject to error. So I did a little bit of maths, which luckily a few people have checked. And 3.8% of 145 billion is a mere five and a half billion pounds gone missing. Right. But there's no fraud. There's nothing to worry about here. Um, so that sums it up, really. Um, the uh, annual budget of the public sector of the BBC is 3.65 billion. And BBC Global is 1.1 billion. So effectively, the EU loses the whole of the BBC's budget. But... There's no fraud. There's no corruption well, at all. That's where it's gone. A trillion to the BBC. <laughs> I knew it would be happiness day today. Yes. OK, um, let's move on to the uh, United States here uh, and uh, foreign policy magazine. Again, uh, the Russia scandal has reached the Trump family. Uh, this is uh, as, and then the subheadline is uh, and only a special counsel can find out how deep the rot goes. This is from Max Boot, uh, who is a who is the Jean L. Kirkpatrick Senior Fellow for National Security Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. So we, we say this with that caveat. Uh, and Max says, uh, th these have been a, a choice few days for aficionados of scandal. Washington hasn't seen their likes since the heyday of Whitewater, Iran-Contra and Watergate. In other words, for nearly two decades. And in many ways, Kremlin Gate, the burgeoning scandal over Team Trump's connections to Russia, is a class by it isn't a class by itself when in the past has an fbi director ever announced that his agents were investigating allegations that the president and his close associates including his senior advisor come son-in-law uh, were guilty of collusion with a hostile foreign power never yet that's what james comey did on the 20th of march when he told the house intelligence committee that the g-men were looking into the nature of any links between individuals associated with the trump campaign and the Russian government, and whether there was any coordination between the campaign and Russia's efforts. To make the uh, event even more surreal, FP says, uh, Comey and his fellow witness, Admiral Michael Rogers of the National Security Agency, all but called their boss, the Commander-in-Chief, a liar by public di publicly dismissing his allegations uh, that former President Barack Obama had wiretapped him. I have no information that supports those tweets. Uh, and we have looked carefully inside the FBI, he said. So that's pretty good stuff. Well, is uh, Foreign Policy magazine correct to be making these comments? Well, a couple of days ago, uh, this gentleman, Senator Charles Grassley, uh, issued a press release. Uh, and uh, it, the press release was about a letter that he had written on the 24th of March. Uh, and in that letter, he said, um, 
According to press accounts, a Republican opposed to Mr. Trump hired Fusion GPS. Now, here's the Fusion GPS website. That is the entirety of the Fusion GPS website. A few lines on a page. Yeah, this, this is the style of, um, of um, a hedge fund type websites, Absol in my opinion. Uh, absolutely, right. you're absolutely right. Uh, that same, same type of style. But anyway, the, the letter said, according to press accounts, a Republican opposed to Mr. Trump hired Fusion GPS to compile opposition research on him. Uh, Fusion GPS then hired somebody called Mr. Steele. We'll come on to him in a second to investigate Mr. Trump's ties to Russia. Uh, the letter went on to say, once it became clear that Mr. Trump would be the Republican nominee, Democrats supporting Secretary Clinton's campaign began to pay for the research. So the Republican opposed to Trump dropped off at that point, and the money continued to be paid by Clinton's campaign. Uh, and then the letter goes on to say, last month, the Washington Post reported that a few weeks before the election, the FBI had reached an agreement with Mr. Steele to pay him to continue his work, noting that the revelation that the FBI agreed to pay Steele at the same time he was being paid by Clinton supporters to dig into Trump's background could further strain relations between law enforcement agency and the White House. So we have Comey sitting in front of the House, uh, the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee, or Intelligence Committee, sorry, saying that the FBI has no knowledge of any of this stuff. Uh, of course, he was being quite specific because he was referring to uh, to Trump's use of the words uh, of the word wiretapping. Uh, but of course, you've got to real, uh, appreciate that Trump is an older gentleman and perhaps doesn't uh, know the latest or understand terminology, the terminology and so on. Right. Yeah. So, um, so this is this is all quite interesting. Now, what was particularly interesting uh, was question three. Uh, in the letter because he had a whole range of questions uh, and he said when did Fusion GPS arrange for Mr. Steele and or Orbis Business Intelligence to investigate Mr. Trump and his associates when if ever did this arrangement conclude and where was the term and what were the terms of the arrangement please provide copies of all relevant contracts in total how much did Fusion GPS or your clients pay Mr. Steele and or Orbis Business Intelligence for this work here is Orbis Business Intelligence Limited. This is a British company uh, based in the UK, obviously, uh, with a couple of people on there that are X, if there's such a thing, X MI6. So this is their business. Um, now, Orbis uh, Intel Business Intelligence Limited, uh, current net worth of £200,000. It's a consultancy uh, and so on. This is their website. This is what they say about themselves. They say they're a leading corporate intelligence con uh, consultancy. Um, and uh, well, they were employed by via money from the FBI and the Clinton campaign to spy on Donald Trump in the lead up to the uh, general election in the United States. Alex, um, this is pretty incredible. What we've now discovered is, it seems, it wasn't the Russians that were trying to interface, uh, interfere in the US election. It was the British. Do you know, Mike, we were talking a moment ago about uh, PACs, political action committees. Um, and one of the well-known ones, uh, which you followed, of course, for many years, Mike, is the LaRouche Pack, Lyndon LaRouche, surname L-A-R-O-U-C-H-E. And one of his claims for 40 years now, and he wasn't the first, but he's the most prominent, has been that British intelligence has been controlling America through its greatest century, the 20th century. And he was ridiculed by Americans and Brits uh, of all shades until a few years ago. Uh, and moments like this really vindicate the old man. Uh, apparently, he hasn't met Mr. Trump yet, but he would like to uh, before his time on this earth is over because he's, he's got a lot of uh, information he's built up. And it's just things like this which have made Mr. LaRouche and other outsiders uh, think that the British have had a controlling hand in American politics for a long, long time. Um, we've also been in, involved in the past with Field McConnell of Able Danger, and one of his unique uh, analyses, together with a British uh, colleague, an ex-Cambridge man like me, actually, David Hawkins, is that uh, we controlled, um, through the Radio Company of America, which was British founded in the 1920s, we controlled American patents, and that became Serco in the end. There is a very deep strain of this. Christopher Steele, I knew personally as a, a fairly senior colleague in the intelligence uh, agencies a decade ago. I found him an affable type, but rather controlling, and always very interested in the peccadillos of Russian business mini, as they call them. So you know, that, that's obviously an English loan word, but it means mafia type businessmen. He's, he specialized in that, and that is the prism through which he sees 
Russian activities. He was always pumping me for information on how Russian mafiosi did business with each other and how they felt about being betrayed by each other. So he's basically mapped that understanding onto Russian and British and American politics, that it's all about shafting each other, to put it mildly. And which is why he came up with, I don't know what resources he was using as a private ex-MI6 officer, but he apparently put Trump on surveillance or something. Uh, there have been suspicions of friends of mine in the past, by the way, that, that similar uh, political and corporate intelligence is practiced in London against political people using private companies. Um, there's been some suspicions for a, a long while there were things that the agencies would have done more professionally, but uh, which became known and therefore must have been done you know, more cack handedly. So I think this, do, this does exist. So uh, Christopher Steele's uh, claim, of course, late last year, uh, and again, cover your ears, this is a lunchtime show, but what he claimed is that Mr. Trump had gone to Russia and had prostitutes urinate on him for a sexual thrill. I mean, that's the level of the claims here. But it's it's not just all whipped up from nonsense like that. There, there clearly has been some real surveillance going on. Yeah. Uh, the other thing we should add in here is that, and a couple of people have mentioned this gentleman in the chat box, of course, if you want to find out about Mr. Comey, um, see the uh, excellent uh, questioning which uh, South Carolina Senator Trey Gowdy has been doing. Uh, there's uh, months and months of really excellent work, <coughs> excuse me, by that committee. And Trey Gowdy has shown himself to be extremely professional, very penetrating in the questions that he's been asking of Comey and other individuals. And you can also see on his face in these uh, formal video clips the shock at some of the answers that uh, uh, Mr. Gowdy has had from, from the likes of, of um, Comey and, and others. Um, disingenuous, covering up, squirming in their seats, and uh, you're left with the impression that they're clearly not telling the truth for whatever reason. Okay, well, let's uh, stick with uh, security related issues. Um, and uh, there's a meeting going on at the moment. Uh, now, the inter this is the International uh, Commonwealth Parliamentary Association and this particular website we've got on screen is the uh, UK branch of that. Now the International Commonwealth Parliamentary Association is uh, the professional association of all Commonwealth parliamentarians. Uh, it has an active network of over 17,000 parliamentarians from 175 national, state, provincial and territorial parliaments and legislatures. Uh, it's governed by an, an executive committee of parliamentarians from all main parties with a membership of members of both Houses of Parliament uh, C and uh, CPA, this is the UK branch, undertakes international parliamentary outreach on behalf of the UK Parliament and the wider uh, International Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. Um, so they say that they have a specific focus on parliamentary diplomacy and parliamentary strengthening activities uh, and that CPA UK seeks, seeks to foster cooperation and understanding between parliaments, promote good parliamentary practice an advanced parliamentary democracy. So that's all really good, Brian. It's democracy. So we, we, we can go home. There's nothing to worry about. Yes. Um, yeah. So what they're saying, uh, they're, they're running uh, this event, which is uh, the International Parliamentary Conference on National Security. It's being held in Westminster, began yesterday. It ends on Friday. It's designed to increase parliamentarians' knowledge of and build capacity on national security through changing interactive discussions, uh, sorry, engaging interactive discussion sessions and networking opportunities with key stakeholders. So that's great stuff. Um, let's have a look at this. Uh, of course, uh, you know, they have strong links with Common Purpose in the past. We don't need to say any more. So here is uh, the website for the International Parliamentary Conference on National Security. Um, and uh, well, what did uh, Michael Fallon have to say? Uh, that we are investing 1.9 billion pounds to develop cyber capabilities and skills across all government departments and setting up a new national cyber security center. Well, they've already announced that, of course. Um, <clears throat> uh, so this is going on at the moment. Uh, they continue to push this through, this whole notion of cyber security. Every single institution, as far as I can see, whether it be NATO, uh, parliament itself, uh, NGOs like this, um, they're just pushing this cyber security mantra uh, Alex, where, why are they driving this particular issue so hard at the moment? I think, Mike, it's because ultimately if um, MI5, GCHQ and the various spin-offs of GCHQ that suddenly have sprung up, if they are able to get a finger in the pie with these um, 
large corporations and international organizations and advise them on how to keep their data safe, then ob obviously that provides uh, an ongoing in uh, for British government uh, officials and, and certain cliques of, within the British government to continue to uh, influence the Commonwealth, NATO, the EU, um, and you know, var various corporations. So the, the, the line between what's British government and what's foreign government, the line between what's British government and what's British business, is blurred by this you know, mutual dependency on uh, the advice of a few so-called experts on cyber security. So it keeps com uh, uh, companies and governments in hock to the British government, basically. Right. And uh, just to finish on this particular section, uh, something else that Fallon said here, which I thought was really interesting. We have numerous bilateral relationships and our partnership with Commonwealth allies as part of our Five Eyes Intelligence uh, Alliance and our Five Powers Defence Agreement. But for me, the Commonwealth has an even bigger role. Defence can banish despair in fragile nations, but the Commonwealth can do more than that. It can bring hope. Uh, I've had the great privilege to see some of the Commonwealth's work up close. And, what, and he, he goes on along this vein. So really what they're, they're saying, Brian and Alex, is, is that, uh, you know, they, the Britain has, has sort of reoriented itself with Brexit. Absolutely will reinforce this once again, that the Commonwealth is becoming the central focus for, for government policy in the next period. They've been running a two-horse race. It was either going to be the EU or the Commonwealth, and then slowly but surely we've seen the, the fact that the, the Commonwealth route gives them instant access, not to just the European population, but a global population. And I, I think the other part of this, Mike, is why the BBC is constantly talking about its global audience. It's no longer interested in UK because its job is to uh, brainwash a world population. Yes, Alex. A quick note from me there, Mike. You unexpectedly mentioned uh, Fallon talking about the Five Powers Defence Agreement. Uh, he mentioned it in the same breath as the Five Eyes Signals Intelligence Agreement, which is between the Anglo-Saxon countries. And people would assume that Five Powers meant the same Anglo-Saxon countries, but it doesn't. The Five Powers Defence Agreement is Britain, Australia and New Zealand offering uh, unconditional security guarantees to Malaysia and Singapore because of the crucial net, uh, importance of the Straits of Malacca to global trade. So again, you see Britain occupying these choke points uh, and, you know, you get shams like the threat of piracy, as we do off the Horn of Africa. And this, I think, explains why the uh, first sea lords and other high admirals uh, have been saying Britain is back east of Suez with its naval presence. What naval presence? And uh, we can assure you that the Malaysians and other East Asians are very interested in our uh, naval capacity. I think it's all about us trying desperately now to um, uh, protect Singapore and Malaysia as um, a hub from which British business, British uh, commercial law, etc. British education can still gain a foothold in the world. OK, thank you for that. Well, let's uh, stick with the, the issue here. Um, Theresa May was in Scotland a day or two ago, and uh, while she was there, she announced a counter-terrorism training exercise in Scotland to strengthen the UK's response to a terrorist attack. Uh, she announced a major, what she's describing as a major terrorist, uh, sorry, a major uh, uh, counter-terrorism exercise. She was visiting Police Scotland, and what she's saying is that Police Scotland is effectively the second largest police force in the UK now, uh, second only to the Metropolitan Police. Uh, the training is part of the UK government's national counter-terrorism counter exercise programme and brings together partners from policing and security, the armed forces, UK government departments and the devolved administrations to, tense, to, to test responses to major terrorist attack. Uh, and uh, they're saying that lessons learned from these operations are fed back to the full range of operational partners, government departments and devolved administrations to further strengthen the UK's response. Uh, and so on. Well, um, Theresa May had said that uh, the UK government considers national security across the whole of the UK a uh, top priority. So another conference is going on at the moment is with Interpol, uh, and that's began today. It ends tomorrow. It's in Abu Dhabi. Uh, and uh, they're, they're saying that today the world is facing a global threat landscape which has never been so complex or challenging. Transnational organized crime networks and terrorists are exploiting increasing globalization and techno technological developments. Uh, and under the patronage of uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, the uh, Unity for Security is an Interpol forum organized in partnership with the UAE and Interpol Foundation for a Safer World. Uh, and uh, it's going to bring together ministers with responsibility for security portfolios, senior police officials, and representatives from the private sector, because we've got to merge these all together, uh, to collectively address common issues. 
um, and uh, they're going to be looking at counter-terrorism, cybercrime, uh, stolen works of art, migrant smuggling is only fourth on the list, with along with uh, online child exploitation. Um, and uh, well, uh, what happened? Well, the UAE Ministry of the Interior has announced 50 million euros uh, for as a voluntary contribution to support uh, the seven key Interpol projects, of which migrant traveling is uh, sorry, migrant sm uh, smuggling is the fourth on the list. Um, so that's. Uh, that's good news, Brian. Uh, well, when I see p uh, police being co connected on a worldwide scale to make us uh, safer, I'm beginning to smile because I see exactly the opposite happening. We're becoming less safe uh, the more we get these global connections. Um, but let's bring in the harsh reality of UK. This is the country that says it's uh, championing uh, democracy across the world. We've still got this lady and there are many, many more like her whistleblower on child abuse. She is in prison. Uh, she's coming up to nearly a year, most of which has been in solitary confinement. And of course, our Prime Minister, uh, Theresa May, um, who is constantly talking democracy and leading the world, uh, is quite happy that this whistleblower is inside. Why is she inside? Without a doubt, because of her knowledge of the involvement of British politicians in the abuse of children. And of course, this is a subject which would destroy the whole of the Conservative government. And indeed, we feel the Labour and uh, Lib Dem parties at the same time. So let's not forget Melanie Shaw is still in prison. She needs our help if she's to be uh, released from prison. Um, well, let's have a look at how this, the British state system works. And uh, we're going to come back to our very brave Metropolitan Police child abuse whistleblower, John Wedger. Now, we did an interview with him some time ago, but we have to say John had been fighting then for at least two, three years to get the truth out about the massive abuse of children in London, prostitution, trafficking, uh, the murder of those children. And as he was able to tell us in the audio interview, this was covered up by the Metropolitan Police, local authorities, child protection teams, charities, and indeed members of parliament. Now, what can we tell you? Well, we just come back to the fact that John uh, personally reported to numerous Met senior officers and then the head of the Met, Bernard Hogan Howe. What did Mr. Hogan Howe do? Well, he took no action at all and he took no action as John was then branded mentally ill, threatened, alienated and put on half pay and his application to retire has been consistently blocked. So along with uh, Melanie Shaw, we see this very brave police officer absolutely brutalised by the Met Police because he's been trying to tell the truth about the abuse of children. He also, John also spoke to the then Minister of Policing, Mike Penning. What did Mike Penning do? Nothing. Uh, he then distanced himself from the case but not to worry because he was later promoted into a more senior uh, job, Minister of State for the Ministry of Defence. Um, we also made sure that his replacement, Brandon Lewis, was informed. What did Mr Lewis do as policing minister? He took no action, he failed to communicate, and then he distanced himself from the child abuse case. But not to worry because in September 2016, he is promoted to the Privy Council and he's made right honourable. Mm. It, it almost makes you want to vomit, I have to say. So there's been no action from Prime Minister Theresa May, no action from Home Secretary Amber Rudd, no action from uh, Bernard Hogan Howe, and indeed no action from incoming Chief Cressida Dick, and no action by the BBC, and journalists who have shown initial action have either been warned off or cried off reporting. Now, let's come on to this man because this is where we come to the central core. Um, this is Mr. Mike Veal. He's the Chief Const Constable for Wiltshire Police. And of course, he is the man who's been investigating Ted Heath. And it is this case which would destroy the whole of the Conservative Party. Now, we discovered that this man had made a really fantastic video. I'll give you the link for that in a moment. Last night, I tweeted out that people should view the video and uh, this was the response. There were three replies to my tweet, 71 retweets and 52 likes. 
this was the video and at the start of my tweets it had had 1873 views uh, early this morning it was up to 2428 now what i'm going to say as strongly as i can this chief constable has stood up to be counted he is trying to do his very best in order to investigate ted heath if you haven't seen this video watch it this man needs our support because i can tell our audience today he he is under immense pressure from the highest levels of government to pull out of his uh, investigation so if we just remind people on that uh, when i initially put it out i got 71 retweets and 52 likes when i put out what can we do to help him letters emails texts uh, pressurize the home secretary get on to this case uh, it's not so good we get 12 retweets and nine likes this is not taking action if you want to do something to help protect protect children in this country it's not enough to simply like you've got to push the information around and you've got to take him you know, you've got to take action yourself and i'll just add this one we've got the meeting for nottingham coming up on the 22nd of april the whole purpose of this meeting is to get people together to take action so if you haven't got tickets yet please get on to the british constitution group website and purchase those tickets um, what's coming into uk it is a dictatorship i'm just going to add that my view on the cyber security is that this is a scam in its own right this is setting up a very very detailed in-depth spying regime for the british public and every contact they've got whether it's Tr president trump or others and um, we see the police becoming increasingly brutalized we need to take action it is not enough to be an armchair warrior emailing and simply uh, liking other tweets alex i regret to say we haven't managed to get through half of the stuff we wanted to cover today but have you got any sort of uh, closing comments really i think mike that uh, i think we, we all need to spend some time actually thinking about the coordination of the different strands of, of unlawfulness that we are coming across uh, i mean i'm getting ideas uh, just coming to me as we talk uh, which are tying up loose ends that have been in my mind for months or in some cases years and so it doesn't matter how uh, well plugged in you may have been in the past i've been quite privileged in that regard we all need to spend some time actually thinking about how it all adds up and in our own different ways at different levels we can do that so um don't just uh, as uh, just as brian says don't just be uh, liking or, or squawking about things uh, that you don't like um, happening to the country uh, discuss them with others preferably in real life as well uh, because that's the way in which the uh, the brain starts uh, flowing as it were and we, we actually start uh, working out what's been done to us you know talking about any any victim support group will say talking about what's been done to you uh, is the first means to a remedy and that applies to a nation as much as it does to an individual thanks alex i'll, I'll just uh, finish by saying you know a like doesn't actually help uh, a like only gives information to Facebook or Twitter about what you like. It doesn't really help distribute the information unless you share it or retweet it. It doesn't go anywhere. So you've got to do that at the very least. And, you know, unless you're doing it, uh, we don't get any benefit from social media whatsoever. Yeah, I'd, we'll end on, on a, a positive note, though. We can say, um, did the tweet, the original tweet, the UK column made about um, Chief Constable Mike Veal did that work absolutely because we've now got public focus on that excellent video that he made. If you freeze the frame that we've had up in the news, it's got the address on it or check my Twitter account or UK Column Twitter account. But basically reinforce and help this policeman. We are taking a major step to bringing down the criminality that is embedded in British government. That's it for today. Alex, thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Bye-bye.